In this video, I'm going to be walking you through the 20-week ultrasound for babies, which is going to be the anatomy scan. For more educational resources, like our pediatrics notebook, check out medicalbasics.com. So before we get started, this video is really designed for medical students, interns, residents, anybody that orders these anatomy scans, kind of giving you a broad overview of what exactly we're looking for. And so first thing, just kind of grouping them into broad categories, you're gonna be looking at the mom, the you know the placenta, cervix, and then going down into the baby, looking at the major uh, categories, brain, face, chest, body, and extremities. So the first thing is going to be looking at the mom. So the the cervix and the placenta are going to be your, your major things that you're going to be looking at uh, when it comes down to you know, pregnancy. So the cervical length is going to be looking at, you know, making sure that this is an adequate length for essentially childbearing. A shortened cervical length is going to predispose patients for preterm labor. You can imagine if that this is shorter, there's going to be less muscle there. It's going to be a, a lot shorter path that the baby has to pass through in the early stage, right? If this is um, smaller or shorter, the baby's going to have a much more increased likelihood of having a delivery before it's actually due. So just documenting on the, the cervical length, it's going to predispose whether or not we need to have more closer follow-ups in terms of looking at that cervical length or whether or not there's any type of procedure that needs to be done um, to kind of cerclage that to, to, to prevent a preterm labor. Uh, the next thing is going to be looking at the actual uh, placenta and the location. So whether or not it's going to be in the AP dimension, whether or not it's going to be, let's say this is, you know, the back and this is the front, whether or not the placenta is located up here or whether or not the placenta is located back there. Also, whether or not uh, how deep into the myometrium or even the muscularis layer that this is. So that's going to be your accreta, increta, and percreta is going to determine, you know, how far, whether or not it's in the myometrium, whether or not it's, uh, you know, in the muscularis layer, or whether or not it's kind of breached past the muscular area, and that's going to be your percreta. Previa is going to be, you know, based off this cervical os or the cervical opening, where is the placenta located? Previa would be actually kind of covering the cervical os. It's going to predispose patients a lot more to bleeding, uh, complications of bleeding during pregnancy. And then something that could be like a marginal previa is it's going to be close to the cervical os opening, but it's not necessarily overlying the cervical os. And so uh, this is actually uh, not that uncommon of a situation where you have a marginal previa where it's going to be close to the cervical os in the very beginning of pregnancy. They're going to continue to follow that over time. And then hopefully this will eventually kind of migrate so that it's not as close to the cervical opening um, as in the very beginning when you identify it. So this just gives us a good idea in terms of, you know, the 20 week ultrasound as a whole, a lot of it has to do with just figuring out how closely we have to monitor the patient. Because in a lot of situations, after the 20 week ultrasound, you don't necessarily get another ultrasound after that if everything looks normal. So the 20 week ultrasound, a lot of it has to do with uh, really triaging and figuring out how closely we have to monitor these these babies. The next thing is going to be your next in uterus for the mom. You know, just like with whether or not you're in pregnancy or not in pregnancy, you can have other complications, whether or not these are going to be large cysts of the of the ovaries that can kind of predispose someone to torsion. And especially when you have something that is growing within your, you know, within your abdomen, causing pressure on the ovaries and potentially causing these to move when, when you wouldn't necessarily have that mobility, that can kind of predispose patients to torsion or predispose them to to the other issues. Also, you know, you can still have, you know, in the uterus, you can still have fibroids or in either one, you can still have cancer. So, you know, a lot of patients, they're not gonna have had other types of imaging of their annexa or their uterus prior to this. And so in this situation, it's, it's good to, you know, just be aware that there's other problems that can arise that you need to just kind of pay close attention to, even though they're they're pregnant, they can still have other issues. The next thing, kind of just broadly looking at the brain, you know, what we're going to be looking at, there's a lot of different measurements that you're going to be making, a lot of different measures you're going to be making of the skull in comparison to the brain, but just kind of, you know, looking at it in a big picture, just want to make sure that the major structures are there, make sure that there are, you know, two cerebral cortexes, make sure that there's cerebellum, making sure that it's an adequate uh, size. What you're looking for in 
the, having the cavum septum pellucidum, which is going to eventually uh, disappear in, in most situations as you age over life. But in babies, it's going to be if the fact that it's present is going to really key you on that this patient has a corpus callosum. That's really what you, what you're most concerned about. This is kind of a surrogate marker because you don't very easily see the, the corpus. So what this will be is kind of your indirect marker. If you have a cavum septum pellucidum, essentially that means you, you'll have a corpus. Um, and looking at the ventricles and looking at their size, you know, your lateral ventricles, you'll eventually see your third and your fourth ventricle and just making sure that they're adequate size. And then that's going to be kind of your, your broad categories. And this is going to be your choroid plexus right here. So those are going to be just your, your major categories. It's, it's a much more in-depth look, but this just gives you a broad overview. Is there something majorly wrong with any of these major structures in the brain? And they're going to be looking at it in, in various dimensions because are various projections, I should say, because there are certain situations that, you know, especially when you're looking at, for example, the cerebellum, whether or not it's large or small, whether or not there's, you know, Dandy Walker abnormality, that's going to be more easily evaluated on a, for example, a sagittal image. The next thing, which is going to be a very important thing, is going to be looking at the face, right? Face is, you know, going to be a very important thing because one, it keys you on to other abnormalities, especially if you have these facial abnormalities. A lot of your um, trisomies are going to be related to or going to have abnormalities of the face, but you just want to make sure that there's all, all the different structures. So you're going to make sure that there's, uh, you know, a good forehead, there's going to be a nasal septum, a nose, you're going to have lips, um, and you're going to have, you know, the chin, you're going to be looking on other projections to be looking better, making sure that there's a mandible and a maxilla, making sure that there's two eyes, and they look normal, and then very specifically looking at the palate. So the palate is important, because, you know, the palate, whether or not they, they have any type of um, abnormality of either the palate or the lip, um, is going to, you know, obviously predispose them to a, a lot of different con conditions and also going to potentially kind of key you on onto uh, looking in for other abnormality and also whether or not there's a nasal bone, which is what we have measured uh, on this ultrasound right here. Next thing you're going to be looking at is the spine, making sure kind of the vertebral bodies as a whole look normal. Uh, looking at the nuchal fold, which is going to be different from the nuchal translucency that we look at in the first trimester for Down syndrome, but look at the nuchal fold and then also looking for any type of abnormalities in terms of the most common would be, you know, spina bifida, which is essentially is you have some type of connection of spinal uh, cord fluid with not that's not within the actual contained within the dura and not contained within the spinal cord so essentially you can have you know a, a meningocele you can have a mild meningocele where you just have either dural outpouching which is essentially the dura is going to kind of encase not only your spinal cord but also in your brain it should kind of have this you know more essentially be within the spinal cord but in situations where you have you know a meningocele you're going to have the spinal cord it's going to have some type of small defect you know within the posterior vertebral bodies and then kind of going back into the back it's going to have this little bubble or out pouching and then if you have actual you know spinal cord roots that are going in there that's going to be more keying you in into mild meningocele so those are kind of those distinctions but really you know once they have this you can you're going to have to look at it a little bit more further whether or not you get in you know a fetal mri or not so the next thing that we're going to be looking at is going to be looking at the chest and so that's going to be your heart, your lungs, your diaphragm, you're also going to have your esophagus. And really what you're going to be looking for, one, are they present and are they normally developed in, in size, especially looking at your lungs, for example. You can imagine if there was some type of diaphragmatic hernia that is into your thoracic cavity, you're going to have a, you know, maldevelopment of your lungs or whether or not you had any renal abnormalities as well. But looking at those, your lungs, your diaphragm, and whether or not there's any hernias, but really what is very important is also looking at your heart. And so you're gonna have very diff uh, various views of your heart and looking for any type of structural abnormalities, whether or not there's any septal defect or whether or not there's any abnormalities of looking at the valves themselves. And really, if there's any abnormality that you see, then you know the, the patient will then move on to actually getting a more formal echo. But this will, will give you, you know, a kind of broad overview. Is there anything 
majorly wrong with the heart. And this is, it happens to be a four chamber view, but there's many different views that you'll look at the heart and look at different structures within the heart. Next thing that you're going to be looking at is going to be the abdomen and looking at the, the various organs. And so, you know, there's this picture kind of outlines that there's, there's different organs that you're going to be looking at. You know, the liver is going to be here. You're going to have your stomach, which is this more hypochoic, anechoic structure there. You're going to have the spleen. You're also going to have bowel that you see here. You don't, you want to make sure that it's not vastly dilated, that there's some type of um, obstruction distally. You're also going to look at the bladder, which is this hypochloric structure right there. So big picture for this is go you're going to make sure that there's no one that you have the presence of every single organ, but also whether or not there's any major abnormality. The major things that you're going to be looking for, and there's many other things that you're going to be looking for, but these are kind of the more, I guess you can say common things. Stomach, whether or not there's any gastroschisis or emphalocele. Remember, emphalocele is going to be covered by actual viscera. It's not going to be kind of free flowing, whereas gastroschisis is is it's just going to be more free flowing bowel that's going to be kind of um, outside of the abdominal wall and other things in the kidneys specifically is going to be looking for hydro so making sure the baby doesn't have hydro because it's a good indication where, whether or not there's any obstruction likewise when i mentioned with the bowel you don't want to make sure that it's not really dilated hydro is another thing want to make sure that there's no either some type of fistulous connection that's that has an obstruction or more commonly my like posterior urethral valves and that's going to cause hydro the other thing i kind of just grouped it here but it's not really necessarily related to the abdomen is making sure that there's a three vessel cord the next thing that you're going to be looking at is is going to be the extremities and so this is important because you know one you want to make sure it gives you a good size of the size of the patient so you're going to be basing it off of both the uh, femoral diaphyseal length and also the humeral diaphyseal length that's going to give you a good percentile in terms of size you also do that with the brain and and, and the calvarium to have a you know what where on the size chart is is my baby and so that's one thing and then also just making sure that there's five fingers and five toes for all, all babies and the reason why this is more important than the actual you know obviously you would want to have five fingers and five toes but the other reason why it's important is because if you can recall there's you know having polydactyl essentially pre is associated with a lot of other conditions that are going to be king you into oh maybe we should look at these specific organs that they're related to a little bit closer and the last thing that we're going to be looking at and i don't have a specific slide for it is going to be looking at the actual amniotic fluid and so measuring it in four different quadrants to, to see how much amniotic fluid whether or not you have poly or hydro in terms of the amniotic fluid um, amount and so that's going to also key you in in terms of you know if if a, if a patient has polyhydramnios it's going to key you on to other conditions that are uh, within the maternal um, or whether or not there's oligohydramnios in terms of the baby itself having issues in regards to you know maldevelopment of their kidneys or also ha subsequently having uh, maldevelopment of their lungs so this is just a very broad overview not going into the specific numbers of everything but more a broad overview on what is it that we look at when we order these anatomy scans? Be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our medical ID cards. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.